Europa. A friend of mine recently said, your books aren't about history. They're about life. And I thought, well, yes, because that's what history is, life. We, we, we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. all right, wait, wait. No, you can handle it. Don't worry about it. We were sailing along on moonlight bay. You can hear the voices singing. They seem to say, ba 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 you have stolen my heart. Now don't go away. As we sang love's old sweet song on moonlight day, on moonlight day. Our speaker this morning is a writer and historian of unparalleled excellence. The winner of not one, but two Pulitzer Prizes. In the words of the citation that accompany his honorary degree from Yale, as a historian, he paints with words. Please join me this morning in giving a huge NCSL welcome to David McCullough. When uh, John Adams received the Pulitzer Prize, we got the word on April 8th, which is Rosalie's birthday, and everybody in the family thought that was entirely appropriate. <laughs> the first call was from a reporter for the AP, Hillel Atali, and very quickly after that, the phone uh, began to ring and with more reporters calling. And it just kept ringing and ringing, and then friends and relatives uh, from elsewhere began calling. And uh, things didn't quiet down until about uh, 7 o'clock that night. Finally, we were able to sit down to a nice, quiet family dinner. And just as we began, the phone rang again. So I got up and went into the living room and picked up the other phone and said hello. And she said, Mr. McCullough. I said, yes. She said, this is Claire Cartwright from the Christian Science Monitor. And I said, yes. She said, I wonder if you're aware of our special 23-week trial subscription. <laughs> it's hard to talk about some of these things without sounding pretentious. But I think of writing history as, a, as an art form. And, and I'm striving to write a book that might, might qualify as literature. That's the, the, that's the aspiration. And I don't want it just to be readable. I don't want it just to be interesting. I want it to be something that moves the reader, moves me. I don't have a favorite book, but I would say that the happiest passage in my writing life were those years working on the biography of John Adams because it was such an infinitely interesting life and because there was such a wealth of material to explore and to work in the 18th century was a thrill for me I'd never set foot in the 18th century you've got to marinate your head in that time in that culture in the 
you've got to become them, in effect. I've always felt that in working on my books, history or biography, that I ought to try and go where my subjects went, try and do what they did. It's, uh, for me, it's essential to get a feeling of what, what their lives were like and what they got themselves involved with. But I also do it because it's a lot of fun. And uh, when I found out that Adams had climbed the tower of Christ Church, I just knew I, I had to do that too. For some reason or other, I got very interested in the idea that Jefferson and Adams had died in the same day. It was phenomenal. And that it wasn't just any old day, it was July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary. These two principal figures, as they said that then, the, the pen and the voice of the Declaration of Independence, friends, political rivals, correspondence uh, died on the same day, July 4th. Now, when we get up into this part of the ladder, we're on steps that were here when John Adams made the climb. And I think that's great. I love it. My concern my worry was was a writing problem. How could I how could I keep Jefferson with all of his fame and his aura, his glamour? How could I keep that from upstaging short, cranky, fat John Adams, who's not known by many people at all? A number of people, I guess understandably, have the impression that working in history and biography can be a an isolated, a sequestered sort of life inside libraries and the rest. And to a degree, that's true. But then every once in a while, you get to open up a hatch like that and come out into the light over 100 feet up above Philadelphia, having done exactly the same thing that your subject, John Adams, did to take in this spectacular panorama. As soon as I got into the Adams material, the primary source material, not books about him, but started reading the letters he had written, the diaries he had kept, the letters that Abigail wrote to him, all of that, I thought, this is the story. This is the man that I want to write about. What happens after a while if you spend a, a good long time reading the letters, diaries, reminiscences, memoirs of people, and reading what others wrote about them, looking at paintings of them, really immersing yourself in their lives, is that you begin to know them. You you do truly know them. So this is the inner sanctum of the historical society. Ah, uh, yes. You know almost before they do something what they're going to do, because you just know them. You know how they react. And in many ways, you know them better than you know people in real life. It's strange. It's weird. This is the Adams uh, family papers, all spread out on these next rows. Think of that. I have those people in my mind. Uh, I, I, I can see them. I can hear them. I know them. And probably nothing can change that. This is one of the most extraordinary things in our entire collection. A letter from yeah. John to Abigail Adams. I agree. Philadelphia, July 3rd. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epica in the history of America. I'm apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. 
It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. He's thinking of a continental nation at a point when the nation, which didn't exist really yet, only reach about, reaches about as far as the Allegheny Mountains at best. They hadn't even publicly announced their independence. No. Yet. I mean, that's, that's a visionary yeah. statement, if there ever was. And he writes it to her. Yes. He isn't writing it to John Hancock or somebody else. This isn't even the only letter he writes to her that day. John Adams referred to his wife, Abigail, as his ballast. When he got low and thought, well, maybe it isn't worth all this, she would boost his spirits back up again, as he would for her, too. All I give to you and you give to me true love, true love. We have a large family, five children, 18 grandchildren, and she is mission control. <laughs> She's also secretary of the treasury. <laughs> and maybe most important of all, chair of the ethics committee. <laughs> She's the star I steer by and I would love for you to meet her. Rosalie, where are you sitting? There. I met her when I was 17, and I was head over heels right from the beginning. I'd never met anyone like her. She was different from any other. Well, I proposed to her when I was um, 18 years old on uh, Martha's Vineyard. And she said she'd think about it. I knew, I just knew this was it. Love forever, true. That's a lovely waltz, and it reminds me of a night when Rosalie and I were the guests of honor at a ball at the Piedmont Driving Club in Atlanta, Georgia. It was the Magnolia Ball and they had the Atlanta Symphony playing the music, and we entered the ballroom as the guests of honor and were told that it was waltz night. <laughs> and I, I don't do the waltz so very well. And I said to Rosie, what? I can't think, because he'd love to dance, but I said, what in the hell are we going to do? And she just said, just follow me. And she was going, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, in my ear, and what? What? One, two, three? Oh, sorry. She was going, one, two, three, one, two, th and pressing my back with her hand and leading me. And we danced all around the floor together, alone, solo. And then everybody else started waltzing, and we kept on waltzing. And later on, there was an intermission, and Rosalie was down uh, stairs, heading for the ladies' room or wherever. And several of these southern ladies came up and said, Oh, we're all just so jealous of you to have a husband who can waltz like he does. <laughs> oh, brother. And, and it's sort of a metaphor for the whole story here because I'm getting the credit and she's there going one, two, three, one, two, three, left, right. I was uh, working at time in life in New York. I had a good job. I was still quite young. We had children. I had no real reason to leave, except that John Kennedy, when he was elected and told all of us famously to ask not what our country could do for us, but what we could do for our country, I took it very much to heart. And I quit my job and came down to Washington to find a job to serve in the government. And I know now that I discovered in that period when I was here, those years when I was living here, I discovered what I wanted to do with my life. Look how sharp that is. Look at all that. They're all cockeyed. They're all been knocked mm -hmm. off there. And this is only half a building here? Yeah. 
When I was working with the U.S. Information Agency, I would often come up to the Library of Congress to work on Saturday for projects that we were doing. And Rosalie would come with me. And one time when we came up, the curator of prints and photographs had spread out a great collection of photographs at the line from a photographer named Histed. I had heard about the Johnstown flood all of my life. I didn't know much about it growing up in Pittsburgh. But I had no idea of how violent it was, how, what destruction. And, and here were all these photographs, one after another. Here, for example, look at this. This was a city, 2,500 people, at least, they don't know exactly, died. That's, as, that's the equivalent to 9-11. And, um, and it all had happened within about an hour and a half's drive of where I had grown up. And uh, I didn't know anything about it. And I went and got a book. And the book wasn't very good. And so I thought, I better read another one. So I read another one. That was the one that was written at the time. And it was very melodramatic. And, and I thought, I'd like to know more. And maybe I could write the book. Write the book that I'd like to read. <laughs> and then you started. And then we got going, didn't we, pal? Like the folks you meet on, like to plant my feet on the Brooklyn Bridge. What a lovely view from heaven looks at you from Brooklyn Bridge. This was a great street, very quiet, very pretty, lots of beautiful trees. Still looks just the same, and in, and in many ways I wonder sometimes why we ever left. There it is, that's our apartment building, 153 Columbia Heights. We would go out, particularly in warm summer days like this, or weekends, out onto the promenade, or out on to the bridge. This is the promenade, as it's called, and you have everything here. The whole of downtown Manhattan, Statue of Liberty out there, ferries going back and forth, and then over here, the Great Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. All those years were very happy years. And some of the toughest years financially when I first tried to make it as a writer on my own. And Rosalie's one of the bravest people I've ever known. Had she not had the, the backbone, the, the balance to have said, yes, let's do it, let's try it. I'm not sure I would have had sufficient determination or nerve to have uh, gone ahead. I feel I've been very fortunate in my subjects, and that subject, that idea coming just then in my working life and in our family life was exactly right. And we come back almost every year, walk the old neighborhood, reminisce about old times, and to walk over the bridge. There was no bridge in the world like this. Nothing of this kind had ever been attempted on this scale. This was going to be the biggest bridge in the world. And it would become the landmark for New York, for the entrance into New York Harbor. Thousands, eventually millions of immigrant Americans coming up the harbor by ship would see this first. This was their glimpse of the wondrous new world of America. I was not a civil engineer. I knew nothing about strength of materials or mathematics. What I did know is that I found that structure thrilling, this magnificent suspension bridge that will take the river in one great leap, as they said in those days. 
And I found the story of those people who undertook that project extremely interesting. The bridge isn't just a great, unprecedented marvel of civil engineering, of the building art. It is that, absolutely. It was the wonder of its age. It was the moonshot of the 19th century. But it's more than that. It's a work of art, and it was meant to be a work of art. It was described in the initial proposal as a work of art. And you can see why. It's a great work of architecture, sculpture, and it has inspired great works of art because people respond to it as a great aesthetic experience, which it should be. I was raised on the idea of counting your blessings. And when I do my blessing countings, I always include the Brooklyn Bridge. A good old Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. The night of the 48 election, I stayed up to listen to the radio. And of course, it went on and on and on, unresolved. And finally, I was just too tired. I went to bed, went to sleep. Next morning, I woke up. My father was in shaving. And I went in and said, Dad, Dad, who, who won? And he said, I'll never forget it. He said, Truman, because he was not for Truman. Well, years passed. And it was I don't know, 30 years later. And I had gone back to see my father, same house. And we were talking, and Dad was going on about how the country was going to hell and the world was going to hell. And I'd heard this all my life. And he said, oh, it's never been worse. It's really terrible now. He said, too bad old Harry isn't still in the White House. <laughs> I reminded him that that had not always been the theme around the house. One night in the fall of 1956, I came out of the subway and I was walking down here on my way back home to our apartment just down the way. And there was a little crowd gathered up here, right about where that orange marker is. And I didn't know what was going on. And I came up and I said, what's happening? And they said, oh, Governor Harriman is coming. Well, I was new to New York, and I was starry-eyed with excitement of being in New York, and I'd never seen a governor before. So I thought, well, I'll wait. So I stood right, right here. Then right behind him came Harry Truman, and former President Harry Truman, and he stood right there. And I was this close to him. And what I remember, is that he was in color. Now, of course, we only had black and white newspapers, black and white magazines. He didn't look like little Harry Truman to me. I was so thrilled he looked seven feet tall. And then he went right in here. There was a political dinner inside the hotel. And I turned and started walking back home, back to our apartment. Uh, excited beyond belief to get back to tell my wife, you'll never guess who I just saw. And I, I have thought often since, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could have one of those moments where you can go back and change things a little, that if I could stand beside him there on that same curbside and just reach out and touch his arm and say, Mr. President, someday I'm going to write the story of your life. Good evening. I'm David McCullough. I'm David McCullough. I'm David McCullough. And this is Smithsonian World. Because of an interview that I did with Bill Moyers for a film that he made about Theodore Roosevelt, a New York producer saw that interview and thought to himself, maybe that fellow could be the host. And that's when I had my first real role in a television series. And it was a wonderful time. Here in one of the great redwood forests of California, the Muir Woods National Monument, a cross-section of a giant redwood, a redwood more than a thousand years old, has been made into a calendar of human history. Here's 1776 and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We made films about everything. Abraham Lincoln's hat and Dorothy's ruby slippers. 
and uh, on and on, and went to places not only here, but all over the world. This is the place right here, just a few hundred yards from the Nile in modern Cairo. Here in the rolling hills of Virginia, this and the other islands of the Galapagos Archipelago, and much of it happened right here, at Darwin's tranquil home outside London called Down House. And doors would open for us. But in the event that doors didn't open for us, or in the event that we, in the event that we ran into some trouble with customs or officials or police or something, we had a big, very beautifully presented letter from the secretary of the Smithsonian, Dylan Ripley. And it had a big gold seal on it. It was written in magnificent calligraphy, and it looked like it looked like the most gorgeous diploma you ever saw, and we called it the Dazzler. And if we ran into somebody who was giving us trouble at the airport or going, Martin Carr would say, show him the Dazzler, show him the Dazzler. So I had the Dazzler in my briefcase and I would pull it out and, <laughs> show. and it worked. Those days are gone, but it was wonderful while it lasts. I'm David McCullough and this is Smithsonian World. Are you having a good time? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Jolie? Yeah. Jolie. <laughs> Once I was on television, it, it, as you know, it, it uh, changes things, and I was recognized often. I, so, I think she would rather meet you than Harrison <laughs> Ford. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I'll never forget That's that. Thank you very much. I was very glad to meet people who would stop me in a restaurant or in an airport or on the street and say something. But I was always very interested in, do you know me because of television or do you know me because of my books? How is it that you know who I am? Oh, they're all friends. Do you remember me? In Tennessee. In Tennessee. Oh, in Tennessee. oh my goodness, in yes, indeed. Tennessee. Can I get my picture yeah, with you absolutely. now? Absolutely. Come on, guys. <laughs> when it first started happening a lot, he was kind of excited about it. And we were in an, I can't remember where we were, in an airport or somewhere. And Dad said, no, really, it happens all the time. Watch this. It happens when you go and watch it happens all the time so we walk <laughs> through the airport and it did happen quite a bit and he said see they all see all those people saying hi to me and i said well dad you say hi to them first <laughs> morning morning Good morning, sir. How are you? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm David McCullough. Joe Crystal. I have your book in my truck. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Glad to meet you. <laughs> of course they say <laughs> hi to you. He gets a lot of teasing, but that's good for him. It's sort of a leveler. And he likes, he likes it. it. Yeah, and it's good for him. Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful experience. It was a magic carpet ride for me. And as much as I've enjoyed the television work I've done on the American experience and Smithsonian world. The problem was that I wasn't getting my work done. I wasn't get doing my real work, which is always the books I'm writing. And so I had to stop. I had to quit cold turkey and uh, get back to the, to the real work, the books. I just wanted to tell you one quick story. I'd been working in this office for a couple of years and my old boss from American Heritage, the editor, Oliver Jensen, was on the island and he came by to see us. And uh, Rosalie and I brought him out here and showed him where I was working. And then on the way back, uh, Rosalie was walking with Oliver, who was a great big fellow, and he leaned way down and he said, now tell me, Rosalie, where does he really work? <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't believe that this was where I worked. I don't know what he expected, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting or something. I, I just don't know what he what he imagined. <laughs> I uh I wanted it to be out here about whatever this is, 75 yards or so from the house. And the one rule I had is that they had to give me fair warning if they came out to see me and that adults really were not welcome, um, unless there was some very important reason. And my rule was that anybody not as tall as these posts could come anytime he or she wanted to. Uh, in other words, little guys 
were free to come. And, and then I had to raise it up a little higher as they got older, it's about that height. But it's, um, it's been a wonderful place to work. Some people who uh, simply have no judgment or tact will refer to it as a shed. Uh, it isn't a shed, it's, it's my office, it's world headquarters. And I have everything I need in here, seems to me. Uh, no telephone on purpose, no computer, uh, no really electronic devices of any kind. I work on this typewriter, which I love, which I bought um, secondhand in 1965 in White Plains, New York. And I've written everything that I have written on this typewriter. And as time went around, they came my way. As time went around, they came. But it's a long, long time from May to December. And the days grow short when you reach September. And the autumn weather turns the leaves to flame. And you haven't got time for the waiting game. When I first met David, I was falling in love with a painter. And there was no question that it just was magic to me. For this young guy that loved books, loved sports, he seemed so well-rounded, but then he could just put a watercolor on a on paper, and, and uh, it just was miraculous to me. It's a lovely pose. Well, I do cartoons for the newspaper. That was easy. But I also did watercolors and oils, and I took classes. Um, I took a lot at, at college, at Yale. It, it helped my grade average considerably, because <laughs> It, it, as I say, yeah, it was easy for me, but I loved it. I took portrait painting, figure drawing, um, and the history of art and architecture, which I thought very seriously I might pursue that. The great thing about the arts is that you can only learn to do it by doing it. And if a, if a child gets that idea early, that that's how you learn things, by doing it, that may be the most important thing you can give them. You can't learn to play the piano by reading a book about how to play the piano. You can't learn to paint without painting. Uh, you have to do it. And in doing it, you suddenly begin to see, my God, I can do this. And then after a while, I can not only do this, I'm getting better. I think the artist in him, it comes through in his writing. He's always making, you see, and I, I love that part of it. And I love the fact that it's, he spent his life trying to tell the story of people that are no longer with us. And I think he knows those people so well that they become part of the household, or relatives, or family, and um, it's always interesting. Okay. <clears throat> I don't think of myself as an historian in the conventional understanding of the word. I'm a writer who has chosen other days from our own, other times, as my field. That's what I want to write about. History is not about dates and quotes and obscure provisos. History is about life about change, about consequences, cause and effect. It's about the mystery of human nature, the mystery of time. And it isn't just about politics and the military and social issues, which is almost always the way it's taught. It's about music and poetry and drama and science and medicine and money and love 
I love to tell a story. And I particularly love to tell a true story of what really happened to real people who were as alive and as human as we are. In some ways, maybe more so. I'm often asked if I could be a fly on the wall for some moment or event or scene that I've written about, what would it be? That's a, that's a hard question to answer. There's so many. But one of them surely would be the day that Ralph Waldo Emerson, young Emerson, recently out of Harvard, went out to Quincy, Massachusetts to visit the old president, John Adams then in the last year of his life. The year was 1825. And Emerson afterward wrote down much of what was said. And at one point, Adams said, I would to God there were more ambition in the country. And then he paused and he said, by that I mean ambition of the laudable kind, to excel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could reinstate through what we do as parents, grandparents, as teachers, as legislators, that old noble ambition to excel. Thank you. It's what you feel about it, this work you've done, this offering you've made and whether or not it's gonna stay in print, whether it's gonna stand the test of time. Will it hold up in the long run? The fact that my books are still in print, I suppose I'm, I'm prouder of that than anything else. I've had, a, I've had a wonderful life. I've had a wonderful time doing what I do. That's the reward. The work is the reward. The, kick of getting back to that typewriter and digging in for another project. That's what I love. I won't, I can't possibly live long enough to do all the books I want to write. I have a, I have a list of project, of possible books. I think there's 27 ideas on the list. So I guess I'll just have to keep on working. Happily. But I let's do this one. Uh, all, my, all my friends keep knocking at the door. They ask me out a hundred times or more. And all I say is leave me in my gloom. So here I stay within my lonely room cause I don't want to walk without you baby walk without my arms about you baby oh baby please come back or you break my heart for me Cause I don't want to walk without you. No, sir. Yee, ba, ba, ba. All right, I'm glad we got that one in. I think that's enough. I think that was great. Thank all of you for being so patient.